When it comes to alleged Sasquatch evidence, there have been many claims made over the years. From video to footprints, to DNA and audio, to just name a few. While it is all still up for debate until we are able to get something 100% definitive, alleged audio seems to be one area of evidence that is quite interesting and potentially promising. So let's talk about audio. We'd like to take a moment to thank a sponsor that helps make these videos possible. Fishing Clash. This is a fun and simple game, yet has enough challenges to keep you busy during some downtime. Realistic graphics and a variety of fishing spots around the world make for an immersive feeling while playing. There's even a Loch Ness map for cryptozoology fans like myself, as well as other interesting locations. With tons of different types of realistic looking fish, you won't run out of species to search for anytime soon. I've actually enjoyed learning quite a bit about different species as you fish for them, with information on each species in your lure album. When it comes to lures, they're an integral part of the game, used to attract the types of specific species of fish needed to level up and unlock new locations. The amount of bait you use will increase size of the fish as well as game progress and player strength. Try weekly competitions to develop your fishing skills, create your own clan to play with friends, or even duel against other random players for bonuses. Play this week to experience the Halloween atmosphere in-game where you can solve daily riddles as well as take part in a special competition for rewards. This event is for all users level 10 and up. To download the game, use the QR code on screen or links in the description below. Use our gift code MONSTERS and you'll get a 3 star rod, 1 mythical lure, 50 luck power-ups, and 30 weight power-ups to help catch bigger fish. Good luck fishing! The Bigfoot Beyond the Trail crew has been fortunate enough to travel to a variety of locations across the United States with a history of Sasquatch sightings and activity. We spend a fair amount of time in the wilderness and have averaged 45 to 50 days a year in the field searching, camping, and hiking in the nearly two years since Bigfoot Beyond the Trail started in early 2021. I say this not to flaunt our efforts or to make us seem like experts or great woodsmen. It is simply a testament that when you spend time in areas that are reputed to have years of potential activity, you probably will encounter wildlife and have things happen, Bigfoot related or not. The more time you spend in the field, the more of the woods you will experience. With that said, however, most of the time when out in the woods, either nothing Bigfoot related happens or you encounter known animals. That's been my experience and largely seems to be the case. Even when suspicious things occur, it should last be assumed that it is Bigfoot activity. An honest researcher should begin with known explanations and work their way down through a process of elimination. It's one thing to see a Sasquatch visually, as many witnesses have claimed to, and another thing entirely to hear a noise that may be produced by one without any way of verifying this. These are all just unsubstantiated claims at the end of the day. What happens too often is that folks in the woods will have Bigfoot on the brain, in which their own bias towards the Bigfoot subject will lead them to conclude the noise or vocalization that they are hearing is certainly Bigfoot related, when oftentimes that likely is not the case. It can happen to anybody. We as humans are susceptible to our own flawed interpretations of a situation. We also have a deluge of television shows, YouTube videos, and other content about Bigfoot that is either trying to delude the viewers or is openly faking Bigfoot activity. This may be done intentionally in many cases, but can also be the researcher deluding themselves into thinking everything they experience in the woods is somehow Bigfoot related. This has unfortunately created an effect where audiences have been conditioned to believe that Bigfoot activity should be occurring every time the camera is on. As mentioned earlier, this largely does not seem to be the case, otherwise we would already have had extraordinary evidence of these creatures' existence beyond a doubt. Now let's get back to audio. Audio is interesting because where alleged visual evidence of Sasquatch, such as videos or photos, is scant and trail cameras seem largely to fail, audio is more promising. While it is difficult to establish when you cannot visually confirm what is making a sound, there are ways of determining origins of known animals. Referencing online databases of known animal vocals, contacting wildlife biologists and animal experts are just a few ways to determine what a sound might be. Researcher David Ellis of the Olympic Project explains it best with this quote about using the bioacoustic method in Bigfoot research. 
Bioacoustics is the study of sounds created by biological entities. The predominant method of study is spectrographic analysis. Computer software is used to create a visual sonogram of sounds. Biological creatures have their own unique common sounds as well as individual characteristics. This tool helps identify both the species and may help identify the specific vocalizer making the sound. Adopting the same method of study helps the citizen scientist looking for suspicious sounds that may be related to Bigfoot. Researchers are looking for specific groupings of sound, say a whoop, wood knock, or particular vocalization. Depending how often you are collecting your data, a bigger picture of what, who, and when something may be coming through your study area. Researchers like David, as well as Chris Spencer and codename Monongahela, have done an excellent job examining alleged Sasquatch vocalizations via spectrographic analysis. I highly recommend checking out the Olympic Project website for more information on this, as well as their individual YouTube channels, all linked below in the description. Sounds like howls, whoops, grunts, roars, Primate-like chattering and whistles are just a few of the reported sounds associated with alleged Bigfoot vocalizations. There are accounts of eyewitnesses being roared at and physically feeling the roar vibrating through their bodies, indicating perhaps great power. Obvious culprits for audio misidentification are known animals. Coyotes can produce an extremely wide variety of sounds and can sound quite frightening and loud at times. Barred owls in particular can make whoop-like noises and even sound monkey-like. Foxes scream and plenty of other animals make noises you might be surprised by. Take some time to learn about those sounds. You can use resources like the Macaulay Library, which is the world's largest collection of recorded animal sounds, as a place to compare your audio with. One of the most commonly reported non-vocal sounds associated with Bigfoot is so-called wood knocking, which is purported to sound like wood hitting wood, or even rock on wood, or rock on rock. As for the types of knocks that are reported, they range from a single loud power knock sound to often two or more repetitive knocks, sometimes three, and usually in an almost rhythmic pattern, or even back and forth between locations. For decades, reports of these so-called wood knocks have occurred across North America. This map, put together by Scott of the Bigfoot Mapping Project, displays 148 reports of incidents across North America in which wood knocking or something similar was heard or observed. A vast majority of these are Class B encounters in which no visual confirmation of a creature occurred, but knocks are heard, as well as some reports including other associated behaviors such as footprint finds, rock throwing, violent tree shaking, movement, or other vocalizations like ones mentioned prior. The map reveals there are 24 reports, which include both a visual sighting or Class A report and wood knocks being heard either prior to seeing a creature or afterwards. One report from 2013 by a pair of campers in Colorado states that they heard knocks in the woods around their camp and noticed a large reddish-brown creature watching them from a hillside swaying back and forth between a tree. They never saw the creature do the knocking, but assumed it was responsible as that is what initially drew their attention to that direction. One report that stands out is a 2012 sighting from the Ocala National Forest in Florida, in which a stranded off-road driver heard wood knocking sounds nearby, then witnessing what he initially thought was a man in a ghillie suit smashing a stick against a tree, creating the knocking sound, only to realize it was as he described it, 
an eight foot tall hairy man-like creature with broad shoulders that then proceeded to walk off with stick in hand when it noticed the man. It is interesting to note there is perhaps a real world parallel to woodnox in known ape species. Chimpanzees in parts of Africa have been recorded throwing rocks at trees. They will throw these rocks at trees that produce a louder and more distinct sound when struck. Some have even speculated that this is a form of communication, or even chimp music, in a sense that they are intrigued by the sound. Chimps have also been observed using rocks to smash open nuts and sticks to pry open bee's nest and the like. Whatever Sasquatch may or may not be, it is interesting to note this type of rudimentary tool usage in non-human primates such as chimps. Some researchers have theorized that wood knocks are not wood at all, but actually just hand clapping, chest thumping, or a similar noise produced by the body. Author William J. Sheehan told me in an encounter submitted to him, which appeared in his book Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, Volume 7, in which a couple exploring a wilderness area in Oregon witnessed a Bigfoot-like creature from a distance and noticed it raising its hands over its head, and when this would occur, they would hear a wood knock type sound occurring a few times. Field researchers have emulated wood knocks for decades to some success. Some claim it works, some claim it doesn't. We've used them in certain situations to perhaps stir up the situation or almost announce our presence. Wood knocks are something I have personally experienced in the forest on a few occasions. The thing about wood knocks is that there are explanations that may be more fitting, especially in cases where no visual or other activity is reported or something like weather could be in play. A few of these possibilities are as follows. The most obvious answer is that there is another group of Bigfoot researchers or other humans in the area, and the two groups might be knocking back and forth to one another, each thinking it may be a Bigfoot. Trees can creak randomly, as well as produce a popping noise when temperatures change rapidly, as well as due to wind causing branches to smack against one another. Falling debris is another one that I've personally heard, which can be quite deceptive. Acorns falling and impacting a hollow tree or branch can make a loud sound as well. Known animals can also be responsible for knock-like sounds. Woodpeckers are probably the most common culprit for this, and if you spend time in the woods in North America, you're very likely to hear a pileated woodpecker or other species of woodpecker. Another possibility is distant antler rattling by either deer, elk, or moose. Ravens can produce a knock-like sound as well. The more one familiarizes themselves with known animals or natural sounds, the more readily you can identify what you are hearing and rule out those known suspects if possible. Context is also key in many alleged encounters and situations. Whether or not it's nighttime or during the daytime, or if windy weather is at play can certainly factor into it. Try to rationalize what you are experiencing before jumping to the Bigfoot conclusion. Out of all the time we've spent in the woods filming Bigfoot Beyond the Trail, there's a handful of strange experiences in which we've heard or recorded unusual audio. As I go through our list, we will replay sequences from the episodes these incidents have occurred in, discuss the context, and have a speculative analysis of said sounds done by Chris Spencer, who is somebody I consider one of my go-tos for strange sound recordings. I am not claiming that any of these sounds are Sasquatch in nature, simply that they are unusual and suspicious, and might fit purported Sasquatch behavior. Ultimately, I hope you make up your own minds about this and other information presented. Don't take my word for it. If you know what any of these sounds might truly be, or have any other ideas, please let us know in the comments, or shoot us an email, or message us via social media. While in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, we visited a rural property with purported Sasquatch activity, as told to us by the family that resided there. We conducted some lengthy interviews about some of the experiences the family had, as seen in the full documentary. One of the nights while camping out in the woods near their home, we were awoken by coyotes and nearby dogs. Overnight audio revealed 
that we had picked up a few knock-like sounds throughout the night, which I will play now in a sequence. Looking at the audio, the knocking sounds appeared to be persistent at certain times during the night, occurring while there was no wind captured and sometimes in between howls and barks. There's actually a percussive right here. And then you got a double percussive right here. I actually like this a lot. This is all dog vocalizing in here. I'm going to go ahead and play it. There's actually movement right here that's not Alex or Eli. They're in their tent when this is going on. Uh, they're on a property that has a, a history of things happening. And um, I, I like this because they're camping out on these people's property when not a lot of people do that, evidently. I, I don't know, but they're a curiosity. They're doing something out of the ordinary, which is going to draw attention at times. Um, the dog's reaction, the dog is upset. It's upset. Something's going on. Something's out there. You have this movement here, and then you have a percussive here. This sounds very intentional. These are very intentional, obviously. I think almost this is almost like something being broken to me. That sounds like break percussives. I could be wrong. It could be a, like a double whack, but they're so close together. Um, I'm going to venture to say there, there's some kind of branch breaking going on. Either way, very well could be the target subjects. Uh, late hour, dogs going off. You have Alex and Eli camped out in their tent doing something of a curiosity to the possible target subjects. So I'm a thumbs up on these percussives. Got a clip called Three Knocks. You can plainly see percussive here, percussive here, percussive here. And I like this one. We'll go ahead and play it. Okay, you once again have the dog howling. He's upset about something. Surprise, surprise. These are intentional percussives. They're being done on purpose. If Alex and Eli can rule out the property owners trying to uh, hoax them, I would definitely say this is a target subject. Uh, it's hitting harder on the left mic, so whatever direction the left mic was pointed is where the percussives were coming from. I would venture to say these are definitely rock knocks. Uh, rock on rock. They're registering up higher in, in the hertz levels. They're very crisp. Just audibly and visually to me, they look like rock knocks to me. So if you can rule out human beings trying to hoax you, I would definitely say these are suspicious and probably from the target subjects. In early 2022, we spent a few days in the Big Cypress National Preserve and Everglades National Park area of Southern Florida in search of the skunk ape. This environment was quite tricky to operate in due to the constant water in the area, as well as dangerous wildlife such as alligators, Florida panthers, black bears, and most of all, the venomous cottonmouth snake. We actually discovered a Florida panther trackway in a sunken prairie, saw a black bear cross the road, and saw tons of gators and other critters. But one of our final nights, while searching a section of elevated trail surrounded by thick cypress trees, we did one wood knock and received a very similar response. So 
I am, however, fairly confident we were the only human beings for quite a ways. The area we were on is located down Turner River Road in Big Cypress Preserve. Turner River Road is a 20 mile long dirt road that goes from Ochopee, Florida from the south to Bear Island Campground to the north. For a majority of this road, there is nothing but wilderness. Given that elevation in this area is practically non-existent, what is so strange about being on Turner River Road is that you can see vehicles coming from miles and miles away, especially at night with headlights. That night of the incident, we were on a trail that is right off of Turner River Road. We had parked there and waited for sundown, and saw only a handful of vehicles driving up and down the road the entire night, with nobody parked near us. So we were hiking up this road over here, the trail actually. Um, but we found out there's some really good trees just around the trail, good for knocking and make a really good sound. And it carries a long way. The acoustics in there are amazing. So we're going to hang out here and uh, we might have found a possible track. It was really suspicious. A few broken branches in that area. So I think we're going to hang around here a little bit until it gets a, lot, a little darker and then hike in there and see what we can uh, stir up. The trail we were walking down was elevated ground surrounded by forest that leads into prairie areas, as is common in the Big Cypress Preserve. We spent a few hours in the area and aside from that knock we heard nothing else the rest of the night that was unusual. Given access to that area by humans is limited and would have been fairly obvious to us, it is for this reason I say we were fairly confident that we were alone that night. But of course I can't be 100% certain of that and for that reason this incident is placed in the unusual category. This was taken, audio taken from their cameras. And so right here is Tate's knock. And then right here is the response knock. This is one of the guys moving. What I've done is taken the response knock, amplified it and looped it at the end. So this is the original clip. These two are the original clips. And approximately two minutes goes by. I'll go ahead and play it. To me, that's that's a knock done on um, on purpose, and uh, very well could be a response to them. It is interesting. It does sound a lot like the same material being used to create the knock as Tate's. So my only thought would be a possibly another uh, Bigfooter using a similar knocking stick as Tate's, but. I've talked to Alex and like Alex said, they're really confident there were no other people out where they were at. So that leads to be, leads me to believe it's highly suspicious. Um, once again, it's circumstance is going to tell you more about what a percussive is, uh, whether it's our target subjects or another human or done by natural causes. And generally speaking, knocks occur when we're doing something in the woods um, and they're announcing our presence to others that might be in the area if the target subjects are around. While in Minerva, Eastern Ohio, we spent time on a potentially active property that Seth and some other STM folks had been observing for quite a while for Seth's Bigfoot project. While there were a few sounds that took place that evening on overnight audio, it was the so-called knock and bubble pop I found interesting in particular. We've got a percussive and then some kind of loop noise. Uh, Alex is calling it a bubble. I, 
I didn't know what to do with this uh, last year when Alex sent it to me right after it happened. I'm going to look at it a little more now. Let's go ahead and play it. I'm curious to the position of the recorder because the this percussive here and this bloop are hitting harder on the left mic, but the right mic is picking up these small percussives. What I'm hearing in this percussive, it sounds more like something falling, um, something because there's a double percussive in there. It sounds something possibly a rock, possibly a pine cone. Uh, another branch hitting the tree and then falling through other branches and leaves and then landing in water. I know there's a pond there, I, and I honestly can't remember if we addressed that last year when uh, Alex first sent this to me. Just going by what I see here and what I'm hearing is I really think there's something solid i don't think it was a another branch it's something harder probably a rock in my opinion it's probably a rock hitting a tree bouncing off a branch falling through leaves and other branches and landing in the water that's what it sounds like to me now the other side of that is is this close it was the recorder close to the pond was it close enough to pick up um the blue probably but then again, it's possible. I've heard people make this sound by popping their finger out their cheek. Does a Sasquatch do that? I have no idea. <laughs> what I'm seeing visually and hearing is something falling after, after hitting a tree, falling through branches and plooping into water. That's what I see. After playing the sound for friend and fellow researcher Jonathan Easley, he described hearing a similar sound in the Sierra Nevada mountains. 2015, Northern Sierra Nevada mountain range, Plumas National Forest. I met up with a group that had kind of been working this area the past few years, and they had some very interesting stories. So I went up there. The first night we stayed up till about 2.30 a.m. Everyone's exhausted from their drive-in, so everyone dispersed to their tents. I went to mine, and just as I was dozing off, I started hearing this popping sound. Now, I didn't think much of it. I attributed it to some sort of bird. And uh, what got me was that it was kind of annoying. I was very exhausted and I kept hearing this sound. So I unzipped my tent, went out there, looked around for what it could be, didn't see a thing. Went back in my tent, start to doze off again, and I start to hear it again. Now, this time I started to hear it with a little bit more volume. And I started noticing that there was something extracurricular to this popping sound. It wasn't something that I'd ever heard before, whether in person camping or on the internet. I went home from that trip and for the next year, all I did was scour the internet to try to find the sound that I heard in the Northern Sierra Nevada mountain range. So I finally came across this podcast and it was Daryl Collier of the NAWAC. And he started talking about something that they've heard called throat clucks or just popping clucking sounds. And as soon as he said that, I knew exactly what he was talking about because that's a great explanation and a great definition of what I heard in the Northern Sierra Nevada mountains. Daryl Collier is in Oklahoma. I am in the Sierra Nevada mountain range and we're describing the same sound. Jonathan was actually able to learn how to mimic the sound with his mouth. Hiking into the epic High Uintas mountain range of northeastern Utah in August of 2021, we had a couple of interesting incidents take place. That first night we hiked about 6.5 miles above the 10,000 foot elevation level, headed towards an incredible alpine lake. Wow. Whew. How you feeling, dude? I'm tired. Yeah, this is definitely tough. We're, uh, we're almost there. We've got about a mile left, so... It was at this point, as we hiked on in the darkness of the forest, both tired and hungry, but singing to keep our spirits up, that we were abruptly stopped in our tracks 
by a loud crash in the trees close by. You hear that? Uh -huh. How loud that was? Dude. You wanna take our packs off here? Yeah. Oh, dude, I'm getting... Wow, that was freaking loud. Weird. Something strange. Did you hear that? Mm-hmm. Weird. Oh, man. I wasn't exhausted. We had more miles to go. when we have our lights on. I know. So you got your night vision out. Yep. Hey, these are some percussives Alex and Eli recorded while night hiking in Utah. There's quite, there's bit of time that occurs between them. Something strange. I wasn't exhausted. We had more miles to go. What's happened is they were hiking to a specific destination. Heard a large crash. And if you watch the video, you hear them speak of the large crash. So they stopped and started videoing. And Alex does a, a knock. And they get this small percussive. It's hard to see. It's right here. And normally I would say that could be anything. That could be even changing of temperature, making a, a branch pop. It could be a small animal moving. Don't get too excited about knocks like that. And there's a lot of pops and cracks going on in the woods, especially in the higher country where you have extreme shifts in temperature. But the context of it, once again, is interesting. Something large was out there. I didn't experience it. They didn't get the first crash recorded, but it could have been an elk, could have been anything, but it stuck around, in my opinion, because the second set of percussives, those are intentionally done. That's not wind. That's not temperature changes causing trees to pop. Those are intentional percussives, and they're close. So... Whatever they initially encountered didn't just run away, it stayed there. I don't know many elk that do that. I don't know many bears that do that. Maybe a cat, but I don't know many cats that do percussives. So once again, we have a situation where context comes into play. You really can't tell anything visually from the audio. A knock's a knock, a pop, a crack, a crash, a tree fall. But what's causing those to happen? I find it really suspicious, honestly, uh, considering what they're doing. They're hiking at night and in an area that supposedly has activity. And whatever they initially encountered did not just run away. It hung out and was evidently watching them. And uh, I, I liked the comment in the video Eli made that the knocks are happening when they turn on their headlamps, when they turn on their lights. My opinion, knocks are usually a case, a, a way of communicating that humans are doing something or humans are there. That's when knocks usually occur. That's just my thoughts on this particular clip. We explored the remote mountain valley for the next few days, finding incredible vistas and views wherever one would look. Our final morning in the area, we bushwhacked out from camp to the woods and did some wood knocks and were surprised to get a response.
in this case, it's during the day, and Alex has made a couple knocks on a tree, on a fallen log, I believe. And he gets what appear to be response knocks. If they were really super powerful, I might get really excited, but especially it's happening during the day, you have a lot of animal movement in an area. There is a little wind. It, it could be just a coincidence. It's just too ambiguous for me to make a call on it. My experience is that knocks usually occur when you least expect it. I don't go around knocking in the woods, and I know people will argue that knocking works and I have good friends that have had experiences because they were knocking on trees. I've never had that. I've never experienced that at all, but I have experienced power knocks that were done maybe 50 feet away from me. Every knock that I've experienced has been a case where I've come into an area and they're announcing that I'm there, and they're usually extremely powerful knocks. They're done intentionally with purpose. Um, I've recorded knocks like these, on my long-term recorders that sometimes accompany other things, whether it's a vocal or a more powerful, more assertive type of knock, could be our target subjects. And I think they do, but probably make some of these smaller popping sounds, whether they do it with their mouth or they're doing it with another item. I, I can't say, but for these, they're just too ambiguous. While in the Mount Hood area of Oregon, filming our Bigfoot Mountain episode, we explored a variety of locations over the course of a week. Something interesting that took place during our week there was when our companion Ron Reed recorded some interesting sounds while camping in an area of the Mount Hood National Forest, which he then played for researcher Connor Anderson, who recorded a similar sound a few years prior in the same area. A few years back, I was camping in Mount Hood National Forest out by this, this lake, and I was out there for a couple days, didn't see any people. Uh, I had audio going the whole time. I reviewed the audio a couple months later, right? Because I was just curious. I never went through it all. Nothing Bigfooty happened. So I, I thought I should do my actual job and listen to everything I recorded while I was out there. So I did. And uh, on the evening of the first night, I recorded this. My first thought was, who the hell is playing jazz music out in the woods? That's the spookiest thing I've ever heard. And so I just kind of disregarded it and didn't think about, I didn't think about the sound again for a couple of years, until a couple days ago, when Ron was in here. Uh, so I was trying to find a place to stay. And so there's this area that's like a, kind of like a hunting camp off to the side. and. It gets traffic. Um, the other night there were some people camping there, but a lot of the times it's vacant. And within 30 minutes I started to hear um, some knocks, but they didn't sound right. Uh, they sounded almost like uh, on an artificial surface. I ended up getting a Yeti mic and a computer and recording that way instead of a field recorder. It got quiet for a long time. I started to go into my car, I reclined the seat in the driver's seat and just kept the laptop there and the mic on top of the vehicle. And I heard something at about 1.45 in the morning. And I couldn't hear it very well being inside the vehicle, but I hit the record button. And it was uh, some pretty unusual vocalizations uh, that was almost like what you would expect from like some Sasquatch howls. But they had like a a melodic like a melody like pitch um, that sounded pretty unusual
I was being interviewed by you guys for the thing, and he had this weird piece of audio he recorded the night before, and it's like, I don't know what this is, listen to this. And I thought, that sounds like the same thing that I recorded. And he didn't know about the thing that I recorded. And those two places, like where he was camped and where I was camped, were less than five miles away from each other. And it's weird. It sounds like the same voice. It's spooky. I don't know if it's a Sasquatch or not, but it's, it's one of the weirdest things I've ever heard in the woods in my entire life. Uh, and it's a bit of a, an odd coincidence that he heard it there too. Okay, this is Connor's recording from 2019. It's an example of uh, sing-song vocalization. Something I've recorded, David Ellis has recorded, I know Monagahela has examples of it. Recently here in Washington, Kirk Brandenburg recorded a really good one, very a lot closer. Unfortunately, this is distant and it's been edited uh, way too much. But you can still see the straight lines. Uh, these are the fundamentals of the vocalizer. And they're going from low to high and then back down to low, which is typical of the sing-song vocalizations. I've called them high-low vocals or low-high vocals, but they have a singing quality to them. I would say it's suspicious. The visual characteristic is not coyote. These are very straight vocalizations that's very typical of our suspicious vocals. They're flat, they're straight. Uh, coyotes will be going up in a lot of different arches. You're going to have yipping and barking in here. This is one animal. That's another distinction that I found with the sing-song kind of vocals. It'll look like, when you visually look at it, it'll look like two animals. It's one animal. But it'll start a low vocal and then jump up to, to a high, like right here, where it still looks like that low vocal is going. It's it's doing both at the same time. I would definitely label this as suspicious. And, you know, the only other possibility is human, uh, if you could rule out human. But even this doesn't look like human. Once again, these are sing-song vocals, uh, similar to what Connor captured in the same area. You have uh, very straight note changing vocalizations going from high to low, from low to high, and then back down again. I really like the end vocalization. It's similar to other things we've captured. It creates a chord. It looks like this vocal is still going before this, as this one starts. It's still the same animal doing it. It's, it's a singing kind of vocal. There's some distant vocalizations here, or as it, visually it looks more distant to the recorder. It could be a second animal, but I don't think so. I think it's probably the same animal doing all of these vocals. But what's happening is it's turning its head as it is vocalizing. So these harder hitting um, vocals are darker because it has its head turned towards the recorder. And these lighter colored vocalizations are when it turns its head away from the recorder. Uh, this is like a yell, a descending yell. I can't discern what these are. Uh, it doesn't visually look like coyote. It's not canine or coyote. If you can rule out human being, then I would definitely label these as suspicious. And they're in keeping with other vocalizations we recorded around the country. Um, I have examples from Washington. Uh, David and Monagahela have examples from all over the country. I call them high-low vocals or low-high vocals because that's what I started calling them when I first got them before I talked to David or Monagahela about them. But they refer to them as singing vocals, and that's what they are. They're, they're very similar to singing. Highly suspicious. Good catch. We actually spent the night exploring and camping near where Ron made the recording. Early that morning, we were awoken from sleep by what sounded like vocalizations and knocks nearby. But unfortunately, unbeknownst to us, our overnight audio recorder had died, and none of what we heard was captured. Learn from our mistake, and make sure you run more than one audio recorder if you can. One of my favorite adventures to date has been our journey to the fabled Bluff Creek region of Northern California. 
being where the term Bigfoot originated in the late 1950s, and where the infamous Patterson-Gimlin film was captured in 1967, there was a long history of unusual activity here. We spent a week there and experienced some interesting things while there, much of it documented in our Bigfoot at Bluff Creek episode. But of all that happened, what stood out to me was an incident on the last night there. That evening, some of the Bluff Creek Project members gave us a tour of the area where the 1958 occurrences took place that spawned the term Bigfoot. After being shown the area, we had an unusual incident happen with Bandit. So what's wanna, going on? You wanna Bandit? go up, huh? Yeah, he's afraid. No, you wanna go that way? I mean... He's not that afraid if he wants right, to Bandit? keep going back. His tail's between his legs. He doesn't do that a lot. He's scared. Yeah. We heard noises. Did you say so he's scared of like gunshots, fireworks, loud bangs. That's about it. Dude, I thought you guys were hitting my, my purple knocker thing. That's yeah. how loud it was. No. So what happened was we stopped there. He went all the way up there and stood in the road and, and we commented, oh, look, a wolf. Ha ha. Oh, it's like, oh my God, there's a, there's a wolf. <laughs> Then he disappeared, he and then you came up, way. and we, yeah. we thought so, he was back there. So if we're on a trail and he doesn't know like to get back in the house, or if he doesn't have a safe place to go to, he will he will duck to the side of the trail and hide. That sounds exactly like what he did. But yeah. we're here. But that's like that's because I mean, of like a loud bang. If he heard a loud bang or something, then that's what would have done it. But dude, like wood knocks thought, aren't like we loud thought that that was we like thought that. that was you guys for sure. Everybody turned. Jamie turned. No. Dustin well, yeah, turned. Everyone like everybody like a... turned and looked over there. No, so if that wasn't anything. Tate or anybody, mm -hmm. that but was then some what of the... we heard wasn't that loud. Yeah, we heard something else over, over here. here that was also like like loud. Like it was like pop, and then like maybe what ten seconds later, talk again, same spot. And then it was shortly after we heard down here. And, that and we thought that was you guys. Heard. There are no wood knocks or anything. It would be up on elevation probably unless it was over the back there somewhere. No, it was like right in line. I stopped immediately. You all right, buddy? Bandit. <whistles> hey, buddy, you okay, man? So he's fine now. Bring it to Ron as soon as they got to the bridge. He, uh, he wasn't scared anymore. Is that Ken? But who did the whoop just now? I didn't hear anything. Yeah, no one... You didn't hear a whoop? Come here, buddy. I, I didn't. I was the only one in the vicinity who had heard a whoop-like vocalization while checking on Bandit. I inquired around camp if anybody else had heard or done such a vocalization, and nobody seemed to have heard anything or done any whoops. It was odd but hard to say exactly what it was at the time. Yeah, he wasn't scared anymore. Yeah, he wasn't scared anymore. Yeah, he wasn't scared anymore. Okay, this is a clip I've looped of a whoop that Alex captured in Northern California with his camera. The uh, first section I have altered to take Alex's voice down and bring the whoop out. This next section is the actual audio unaltered that the camera recorded. He uh he wasn't scared anymore. 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 Okay, this would be considered a short whoop, in my opinion. It's much more common than the classic slide whistle whoop whoops that we encounter. I've recorded both this and the slide whistle whoop and I've experienced both in person. These are the kind of whoops you usually get when humans are around and they usually accompany knocks uh, it's just a quick communication they're run this one is running right around 700 hertz really means not a lot because hertz levels are not a good way of determining whether something's the target subject because they're running the same range as we do they run the same ranges as other animals do i have examples of human beings doing whoops down in the high 400s all the way up to the 900s I have examples of suspicious uh, whoops running the exact same ranges. I don't get that excited about Hertz levels anymore. Knowing the context of the recording and the visual character of it is more of an indication of what it possibly could be. This isn't canine in my opinion. Uh, there's not any other canine going off at the time. There's not any coyote uh, howls, yips, screams going off. 
But what is happening is there are some percussives occurring around their camp before this happens. And the domestic dog in camp is visually upset and not behaving the way it normally does. So that may be an indication that this is our target subjects. This is either a human being or it's the target subject, in my opinion. And I believe Alex was able to determine no one in camp made this sound. That, with the knocking going around camp and the behavior of the dog, makes this highly suspicious. Laos Camp, where the noise occurred, has been host to many strange encounters since the 1950s, including a Sasquatch sighting by James Bobo Fay, and even another strange audio incident just a few years ago happening to Jonathan Easley. Three days later, I'm going through my recordings, and I'm looking if I have anything usable from that scenario, and all of a sudden, I start to hear this yell vocalization I started to really scratch my head over it I contacted the people that were in camp saying hey did you do some sort of strange yell did you do some sort of sneeze did something happen while you guys were talking to each other I got no's from everybody I can't rationalize that it was someone in camp it just doesn't sound like the voices of the people that were there. And those were some of the more interesting incidents we've had happen to us thus far. I want to thank Chris Spencer especially for his invaluable analysis and commentary and for being a general wealth of knowledge when it comes to audio. I definitely recommend checking out his YouTube channel. As mentioned earlier in the video, I do not claim what we've experienced was necessarily Sasquatch, although that may be a possibility. Until we are able to verify that somehow, this will all remain relatively speculative. If you're interested in this subject, just remember to keep a level head and be skeptical of broad claims without much substance. The truth is out there for those willing to dig through the muck. Click the link in the description below to download and play Fishing Clash.